I've been asked to talk about the three bases of inside dialogue. And in part, it's, uh, you might say these talks come out of a general um, service to the community, a way of understanding what's happening in inside dialogue, one framework for understanding it. Uh, and in fact, that's how it began for me. Uh, I was trying to understand as I was going from retreat to retreat, something that you might just uh, summarize as what's going on here. Uh, from the beginning, I had seen quite astonishing results happening for individuals here and there. And I thought, wow, that'll never happen again. Or that retreat was really special. And uh, to my surprise, uh, the next retreat, different things would happen or some of that would happen or there would be this, uh, uh, again, feeling of uh, uh, awe, really, um, at the kinds of transformations that people were experiencing. And I wanted to understand that um, uh, in part so that I could teach more effectively and so that I could train other teachers but also just because uh, it was surprising, I, you know, I'm curious. And the kinds of experiences that were reported to me uh, were both very much along the lines of traditional practice where people were experiencing, let's say some insight into anatta, to not self, or perhaps some experience, sometimes even scary, of impermanence or, um, uh, you know, decentering of the self, this kind of thing. Uh, and then there were also the kinds of, uh, uh, I was regularly getting feedback that people were experiencing uh, greater continuity of practice, a very rapid development of their practice, of their mindfulness, their concentration. Uh, experienced meditators were telling me, you know, I just came off of a retreat for several months and I uh, you know, last year and this year, going to this retreat, within a few days, the samadhi, the concentration was, you know, uh, on a par with that, which really surprised me because I have a lot of respect for traditional practice. And people were also reporting uh, uh, any evolution in them of metta, of loving kindness, of compassion for themselves and others. So it wasn't just that I was projecting onto the uh, participants, oh, this is really great. I was getting concrete feedback, written feedback. I used to always hand out questionnaires and ask for the feedback, and I'd read them all. So uh, what was going on? There's something that was clearly um, what I would call liberative was happening here. And by that I mean in the traditional Buddhist framework, the diminishing of the hunger that was driving people, I was getting that feedback, but I was also seeing it. I was seeing a deeper calm, a deeper understanding internally, and uh, diminishing of greed, hatred, and delusion. Again, people were reporting this to me, but you can also see in pe how people interact with you, how they behave. and. Um, Sometimes there were quite surprising and remarkable reports from people who had very strong psychological difficulties, you know, so, uh, social anxiety for which they were seeking therapy or even taking drugs, having level shifts in their well being after inside dialogue retreats. So the liberation that I refer to is uh, definitely framed in the Buddhist sense of seeing through the trance that we have in the body and the mind, that the world is like this and believing the story that the mind is making, the constructing process is being inhabited. But I also include in that sort of the unbinding of the mind of the heart that happens um, within our everyday relations as well. So uh, watching this and wondering, wondering a lot, there were certain uh, aspects of the practice 
that were clearly effective. And gradually those began to cluster and finally settled into what I call the three bases of insight dialogue, which are, of course, the meditative qualities of the mind, the wisdom element or dhamma, and relationship itself. Now, each of these aspects, each of these bases, um, as you could imagine, is powerful in and of itself. You know, if you, let's say, develop mindfulness to a high degree without doing it in relationship or without a lot of guidance from the Dhamma, you will begin to see things. It's that simple. Something, some seeing that frees will happen. Uh, and so on with other meditative qualities. And if you simply investigate the Dhamma and really look at how it might apply to your life, even if you're not meditating, even if you're not exploring in relationship, that Dhamma will, uh, some piece of it could get in and really change you. And likewise with relationship, which we know is powerful. I'll speak about that in a moment. So in traditional insight meditation, we have the combination of Dhamma or wisdom, wisdom and peace with meditative qualities. You go to a Vipassana retreat, you go to most, most Buddhist meditation specific uh, trainings or retreats, and what you'll, what you'll be experiencing is a combination of those two. Some teachers will much more emphasize just meditation practice as such. They won't offer a lot of formal Dhamma, but even when that's happening, the meditation practice that they're offering comes from the Dhamma. The method that is being offered is a time-tested traditional method, possibly offered by the Buddha, possibly evolved in some later culture, but drawing from that tradition. Some teachers will emphasize perhaps a little bit more of Buddha Dhamma, a little bit more teaching, this is the nature of mind, or take a look at this, and they'll teach about hindrances or enlightenment factors or greed, hatred, and delusion, this kind of thing. But the uh, uh, power of the retreat happens in the, between those two, the meditative qualities of the mind and the wisdom. Um, but because relationship, speaking, listening, being with another, the eyes being touched by the face of another interaction, it can be very destabilizing. It can be exciting, it can be scary, so in a traditional retreat, you leave that out. It makes tremendous sense. I've done many silent retreats and been grateful for just the simplicity of only my internal mess. I don't have to deal with everything else, right? Um, at the same time, um, that minimizing of the relational um, is also perhaps um, shutting off or not taking advantage of the power of our intrinsic relationality as human beings, our evolved relationality um, to foster and strengthen the meditative qualities, to strengthen the investigation and the wisdom. So um, what I'd like to do then is talk about each of these three bases a little bit and then we can explore how they work maybe in pairs. And when we get to the big picture and we see how all three work together, we might begin to get a sense of, um, yeah, maybe this is a way of understanding the efficacy of this practice. Um, so starting with the meditative qualities of the mind, what I take as a basis is absolutely traditional, canonical, and that is the factors of awakening. Uh, it was uh, a, tr a teaching offered by the Buddha many, many times in many discourses, and in it he's naming these qualities that when they come to fruition, when they're developed, the uh, awakening, the factors of awakening, the factors of enlightenment, 
the awakening is ready to happen spontaneously because the mind is so um, sensitive and bright and alert and so on. And those qualities are the mindfulness, the investigation of phenomena, the investigation of states, energy, joy or rapture, tranquility, concentration, and equanimity. And uh, each of these qualities, just any one of them, developed to a high degree, is already very powerful. For one thing, if you take any one of them, we, you know, there's a lot of people have thought and studied or practiced or taught mindfulness. So let's take, let's make it a little harder and take something like, uh, let's say, energy or tranquility. So when tranquility, let's say, is developed to a high degree, the mind becomes very still, the body relaxed and stable. And simply by the diminishing of the vibrating of the organism, uh, it's like we've always been attached to some big motor that's been vibrating us. You know, it's like strapped onto our back like a diesel engine or something. Someone turns the engine off, and all of a sudden the world is not so blurred. Our visual systems, our auditory systems can catch up with the world, and we begin to see beneath the uh, noise that we couldn't see, we couldn't hear, we couldn't process, we couldn't understand before. Um, but likewise, when even one of these qualities is developed, like tranquility, it has the effect of drawing in the others, like the, like the suction of a well-designed fireplace draws in the oxygen. This draws in the other factors of awakening. And the tranquility will naturally incline towards the joy, towards the rapture, as the body enters into the unagitated state and the natural rapture begins to be known. Tranquility will naturally lead to concentration with the stillness and the brightness coming together in one pointedness and so on. And when you talk about the relationship between the different factors of awakening, you have within that one base, the meditative qualities of mind, already tremendous synergies and interactions where the mindfulness and concentration, which is sort of the classic sati, samadhi, uh, you know, how do you balance your practice? It's often spoke of, spoken of in that way. That uh, synergy and balance where the mind is extremely alert and attentive, has the sati sampajanya, the sense of what's going on and why one's doing it, together with the penetrating quality the one-pointedness, the serenity of concentration, so that what is seen, what is known by mindfulness, is penetrated, is seen at a depth that's extraordinary. So that's a, you know, just one example of synergy within the factors of awakening. Um, so you do that just, you do a practice with just the meditatives, and as I said, it's going to change you. You know, something's going to be known. And as a result of the knowing, which is a body knowing, a body mind knowing, something will let go. Now, in Insight Dialogue, of course, the, uh, the meditation instructions, the guidelines, pause, relax, and so on, are, you might say, the home of guiding and developing the meditative qualities of mind. Uh, but meanwhile, of course, in a retreat structure, you also have the silent practice, you have the noble silence, um, and all the other things that support the development of these qualities together. So the second base is the wisdom base. And when I refer to wisdom, the main thing that I'm talking about is... Um, Let's say it's a liberative understanding of the human situation and what to do about it. Um, now, there's the liberative understanding that has no system to it. We could call that Dhamma. And then there's the liberative understanding that is systematized, which we could call Buddha Dhamma, the formal teachings. 
I'm talking about both really. It doesn't have to be Buddhist as such, um, but there's in, you know, in my offering of the practice and my framing of the practice, uh, the Buddha Dhamma is the, the key reference point because if there's teachings, let's say in other wisdom traditions, they may be really valuable and helpful, but if they conflict with the, you know, the Buddhist teachings on the human situation and so on, um, it would probably just bring confusion. And uh, so I'm, uh, if there's no conflict, then yes, no problem. We, we say that's a, a good place for a, a wisdom piece within Insight Dialogue. And um, if it adds something extra and there's no conflict, maybe that's a great thing. People have to check that out for themselves. Uh, but if there's direct conflict, probably better to set it aside. Um, yeah, so the, you know, with this reference point of Buddha Dhamma, there's mm, just as a way of getting a handle on what is wisdom, I gave a lot of thought to how can I take this enormous teaching body that was, that's offered uh, by the Buddha that's placed into the Pali Canon. And I, uh, condensed it down to just three things, three really broad things, just as a way of getting a handle on it. See if it's useful for you. And the first is, what is the human situation? So obviously these are the teachings on suffering, the nature of suffering, the possible end of suffering, and really looking at things as they are in this lived life. That's a wisdom teaching, and it's found throughout the discourses. And then the next one is quite vast, and that is the structure and the function of the organism. So by structure, we might be talking about something like the aggregates and you know, uh, ways that perception uh, occurs through the sense bases and so on and so forth. Where when I talk about function, it's like you set all that in motion, what happens, <laughs> you know? So when there's the contact and feeling arises, then the hunger comes forth and, and there's clinging, you know, and self comes out of that. So that's a more of a, a dynamic uh, view of the unfolding of the human experience, moving towards stress, suffering, confusion, and ignorance, or moving towards release. So you can see it, you know, you can have some sort of reference point uh, in that you draw from a wisdom tradition, which importantly, especially in our kind of scientific culture, um, it's good to remember that these things have been tested of a, by a community of peers for well over 2,000 years. So if you want a scientific basis, um, scientific method when it comes to sub subjective experience is a difficult thing. But uh, the basic uh, components of science, which is people testing other people's findings and it being evaluated by a community of peers and being um, validated by the results, which of course is in the human experience, um, this is all extant. In the you know in this tradition, so it's just good to remember that. And um, so, the third thing is what we're often familiar with. So we have the you know human situation, the structure and function of the organism, is method, the method leading to the wholesome. So we have not only explicit meditation practices, which obviously are taught throughout the discourses and have been uh, evolved and handed from uh, generation to generation in human transmission, uh, whether their practices focused on particular factors of awakening like mindfulness practices or samadhi, concentration practices, um, uh, but it includes the whole um, spectrum of the Eightfold Path, all of the ethical aspects 
our method. How do you live? What do you do? All of the teachings on structure and function, I take as also teachings on practice. You don't just study something like contact or clinging or craving as like, oh, well, that's interesting. You practice it. You live it. So all of the teachings on Dhamma, as far as I'm concerned, are teachings on practice and method as well. So with that sense of uh, the wisdom base, uh, you know, that is essential to insight dialogue, we see that you know, when we look at the practice, the portal, the channel by which it comes in is the contemplations. Right? It's not the only place it comes in, but it is the primary place that guides the mind towards these possibilities. And then each practitioner, each pair, or each group of practitioners is invited, as you know, ehipasiko, come see for yourself, have a look. It's not saying, this is true, you better believe it, or get out, or something like that. It's really, look over here at this moment of experience as you're in practice. And that's the investigation factor, the enlightenment factor of awakening, beginning to support the wisdom factor. And the wisdom factor that's doing the pointing is supporting the investigation factor. So this third base, after the meditative qualities of the mind, the wisdom, is relationship. Now, as I said, you know, it's probably a good thing that it was left out of traditional practice uh, as uh, uh, the foundation of that practice uh, was developed and handed down over time because without some kind of method and a deep respect for the things I've already said about the traditional aspects, the wisdom aspects, the meditative aspects, the relationship stuff really has uh, uh, some special features, let's put it that way. Um, for one thing, it's not optional. You can meditate or not. <laughs> You can study Dhamma or you reflect on the nature of mind or not. You cannot survive without relationship. You cannot live. It's just, it's just not possible physically to live. And in our society, in our culture, all the more so because, you know, uh, we're, not, we're not in a situation where we're picking our food from the jungle alone by ourselves out there. And besides, if we were, some other creature that wants that food would attack us. And unless there were a few of us working together, we'd be eaten. I mean, it just doesn't work, aside from the fact that probably we would lose our sanity as well. Um, so to really drive that home, you know, you might reflect on the... the depth of our relational nature, the structural nature of our relatedness. Uh, scientists have debated how did the human brain get so large? And it seems, you know, that, I mean, a lot of evidence points to the correlation of brain size with the size of social groups. And the evolution of brain size allowed larger social groups, which allowed a higher level of function, leading to, of course, what we have now, which is human beings as the dominant uh, species on Earth, the dominant predator, the dominant factor in the destruction of the environment and the man manipulation of the resources. And um, it's not because of how smart any one of us are. It's because of how we work together. You know, you can look at a the engineering of a large building. One person could never ever do that. The development of a computer. One person could never ever do that. But computers bring people together from all over the world and whole other levels of, of uh, 
efficacy of the human species comes into play because we're communicating in that way, things that would never be able to happen. And you know, we're the only animals that can, can um, cooperate that way in ways that are so flexible and in such large numbers. So the, the power presents itself, well, you know, let's remember towards good and towards what bad or evil or unwholesome or sad results. I mean, uh, large scale weapon systems are also the result of cooperation. It's strange but true. War and the, and the military organizations, large scale social organization. But then again, so is Doctors Without Borders, so is the Red Cross, so is the medical research, so is the development and sharing of, of wisdom teachings in, you know, within religious or philosophical systems. I mean, it can go any, any kind of direction. And um, we're motivated by this stuff, you know? We're motivated to uh, experience uh, each other in ways that are not only pleasant, but that bring about uh, some kind of understanding, some kind of safety. And the ways that we experience the cutting off from our social, you know, social engagement is painful. And it's the same pain centers in the brain that experience physical pain. This hurts. This literally hurts when we're cut off. And so there's a purpose for that, right? That's gotta, that's, there's got to be an evolutionary reason for this. Well, think about it. You're experiencing social pain, indicates something's wrong, and we're alone, we're vulnerable, so better, better get on it. You know, better make some new connections or repair old ones, whatever it is we have to do. So the depth of our relational nature, both structurally and in this very life, in this one life of ours, all the construct, constructions that we've built in, in the mind, the memories, the, the urges, and so on, the social nature of all this is not in doubt whatsoever. The key piece in terms of our understanding insight dialogue and moving on to the power of these three bases working together is that all paths of entanglement and freedom are as inherently relational as they are individual. We cannot speak about a solo individual path of awakening when the creature about which we're speaking is intrinsically relational. Now we're also intrinsically individual. You know, it's not an either or. It's the paradox of being human. We are both. So we need to um, kind of, as we go into this exploration of inside dialogue and how it works together, maybe come in with a respect for that power, the power of the relational. Um, the um, importance of uh, social encounter you see throughout the canon, you see throughout the Buddhist teachings. The um, institution of the, of the Sangha, of the ordained communities of nuns and monks was not an accident. It was clear that the work that is done in community is a work towards the effacement, the wearing away of the rigid or pointed, hurting, confused aspects of self together. Because we see, we see things with others that we can't see alone. In and of itself, relationship is going to be a powerful force in our lives. It's just built into who we are. 
when that relationship is framed through a mutuality of intention, as it is with a, a formal sangha, towards the unbinding of the mind, of the heart, then its power goes to foster that, right? The same way if we work together just to get money or just to hurt people, we're going to have some power in doing that. So this is applying that power, harnessing that power towards release, towards understanding, towards the ending of ignorance. And uh, because there's, especially in the West, where we don't have the community ethic that you find in Asia, which is you know, built in to, uh, I won't just say Buddhist practice, I'll say Buddhist culture, Buddhist societies. Uh, it's really important for us to, I think, reflect on and respect the teachings that were, that were found in the canon. They're often not mentioned that support the importance of relationality, the power of relationality. The Buddha spoke about taking others as examples, the power of spiritual friendship in the sense of teachers, and that can be formal teachers or others from whom one hears the Dhamma the mirroring that we get from others. All of this stuff was given voice by the Buddha directly, at least according to the canon as we have it. So um, you can also look at, for example, the Brahma Viharas, loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, equanimity. These are all relational factors. And when I talk about the relational factors of awakening, that's just as we have the factors of awakening as the touch point for the meditative qualities, the Brahma Viharas, together with shared intention, are what comprise what I call the relational factors of awakening. Factors that when brought together, when working together, incline the mind, incline the relational experience towards the wholesome, towards release, and uh, as they become, let's say, stronger, more stable, brighter, become more powerful, actually, in freeing the heart. So uh, just to give you an overview then, um, let me just show you this. And you can see that, um, you know, uh, these three factors of the meditatives, the wisdom aspect, and relationship are overlapping together. I'll talk about the synergies in just a minute, but just to give you the big picture, um, you know, we'll be looking at how do the meditatives, meditatives and the Dhamma work together, which we began to talk about. How does uh, the meditatives and relationship foster each other? and then the wisdom and relationship, how do they foster each other? And how in the middle do we have the, uh, you know, the overlap of all three that constitutes this practice? So I began to talk just a little bit about the meditatives and wisdom. Uh, so, just to touch in again, where you have that overlap, which you see again in traditional practice, Buddhist practice communities, um, they're supporting each other. Sometimes you focus more on one, sometimes you focus more on another. Certain teachers will have different orientations, different styles. Certain students will be touched more by just, no, I don't want any of that conceptual stuff, I'm just going to go for the sati and samadhi and let it carry me. That's fine. And then there may be a point at which just the right little wisdom seed comes in and this person's mind is, let's say, very still, very bright and steady. There's a lot of energy and still there's tranquility. And then someone points to, let's say, something as simple as anicca. 
Now, they may have had come to the edge of it, and maybe they're given the specific piece of all constructed phenomena are impermanent. One thing, simple concept, deep concept, and it's not saying believe this, but that bright mind, just where the language goes from concept to experience, let me look directly. And one looks where one didn't look because the, the Buddha and his, you know, his uh, students that followed on over the next couple thousand years have checked that out and said, yeah, this is, this is an effective piece of information. And you look and you, you see what you didn't see before, perhaps. Um, and likewise, when one is um, developing meditative qualities of the mind, not only is the method itself by which one is developing it coming from the wisdom tradition, but in fact, for some people, it may be very much the case that bringing into one's meditation practice formal dhamma and investigating as part of one's practice, let's say, hmm, I'm going to sit here for this next 40 minutes, let's say, and I'm going to observe the rising and falling of a certain, you know, hearing, seeing, tasting, touching, smelling. I'm going to draw from that teaching on the sense bases. Or perhaps I'm going to draw on the impermanence of, uh, of, of feelings and perceptions. And, you know, so you take some piece of wisdom and you make it a point of focus. Concentration deepens, practice deepens, and the development of the meditative qualities is being fostered by the wisdom aspect. And so it goes back and forth as one deepens practice or investigates in different ways. And this will vary for each of us on any given day or in any given phase of our lives, depending upon our, our background and what's ripening. Um, and then, as I said, also it will depend upon who we're with, how we're influenced, our teachers, and so on. But that's the classic combination. What is perhaps, I don't want to say new because it's certainly not new, but what is perhaps called out in insight dialogue practice is um, this combination of meditatives and relationship and how they support each other, the synergies that happen. Uh, so I'll just touch a few uh, pieces on that because experience is what makes the difference, not just talking about it. But let's just start with sati, with remembering, remembering the object with mindfulness. So where I might sit individually, alone, and in silence, and uh, aspire to cultivate mindfulness. The arising of thoughts and so on, the mind hooks onto them and they can easily carry me into wherever the conditioned mind is you know, urging to go at that moment. Well, gradually, the body-mind may calm down, stabilize, and mindfulness may begin to strengthen, become more steady. But when I sit in front of another person, and we have this shared intention of the practice towards understanding, towards awakening, towards developing these meditative qualities, then just the fact that I'm in front of this person, this person's in front of me, creates a, a situation where between us, it's as if we have a sign on us that says, are you present now? Are you here? Are you awake? How's your mindfulness? And each time I pause, it's a model for you to pause. Each time you pause, it's a model for me. And that little candle in the house of mirrors begins to vibrate and amplify with the luminosity of the mind that is being tended to, that is being cared for in a careful way. But likewise, investigation, another factor of awakening, Dhamma Vichaya. So we're investigating something together with the contemplation that's offered. 
And not only do you keep me focused on that investigation, because I could, you know, I could just go sit in a corner and investigate by myself. How long am I going to stay with it, you know? Uh, until some sort of thought of the beach or of, you know, my new car or something comes up. Well, with you, if, if we're talking about something like that, and I start talking about the beach out of nowhere, you're going to say, what? You know, we hold each other. We, folk, we help each other focus the mind, and the investigation gets endurance and steadiness, and it gets the heat of energy, the virya, the meditation, uh, the meditative quality of energy, another factor of awakening. And here we are really investigating together, not just intellectually, although that has its place, but always in pausing and getting ready to speak the truth, bringing it into the body, bringing it into the qualities, the mind states, and saying, where is this now? And relational, I'm gaining perspectives on whatever it is we're contemplating, like let's say suffering or the end of suffering or generosity or something like this. I don't have those perspectives, you do. So you're the teacher and I'm the student and I'm the teacher and you're the student in this peer-to-peer -peer relationship. And because we're together, that teachable moment is always available for us, between us. The moment when I might be just ready to hear exactly what you have to say and vice versa. So the relational aspect of fostering the meditative qualities, and you have the meditative aspect of fostering wisdom, right? The investigation is happening. I'm beginning to see things that I haven't seen before, but it works the other way as well. Because as the sati becomes steadier in mindfulness, as the tranquility or the equanimity become more balanced, the sense of, um, availability between us grows. The steadiness, the openness of the heart, the sense of uh, safety and respect and the sense of uh, um, being together in this profound experience actually cultivates these qualities of the loving kindness. You, t you speak to me of your suffering, the compassion, springs forth. I'm not practicing compassion. It springs forth. Or maybe my contemplation is compassion and I actually widen and uh, deepen and refine the quality of compassion or sympathetic joy. So the relational is being affected, evolved, synergistically feeding back and forth with the meditative qualities. And likewise, the, med the wisdom aspect is not only being fostered by the investigative relationship, the wisdom aspect itself is in turn returning the gift to the relational. So that my experience of being with you or being with multiple people in this investigation, we're joining together in this investigation of the shared human experience. We're allowing the touch and the touching to happen among us in a way that is guided by this wisdom aspect. And there's an, a, in that process, a uh, evolution, a, a maturing, a ripening of our relationship. So we come to the intersection now of all three of these. So if you can consider uh, that any one of the dynamics that I've just been talking about for a little while here, the synergistic amplification, acceleration of, of meditative qualities in relationship or between meditative qualities and wisdom, between wisdom 
and the uh, relationship and how that feeds each other, any one of those can develop, shall we say, a certain heat or a certain power. And in many dimensions, you know, I was just touching certain examples in a big universe of possibilities. But when they start all working together, um, I think we're beginning to get a glimpse of uh, why insight dialogue as a practice, and if I can go wider than that, a relational understanding of the whole of the Dhamma uh, can be such a beneficial um, and compelling uh, understanding. So if we take, pick up where we were and we say, okay, so we sit down together, you and I, let's just say it's a pair because then I only have two hands, you know, it's easier that way. So here we are, we sit down together and already because we're in inside dialogue practice, there's a shared agreement, there's a shared intention that we're here to do something together, something that is wholesome. Maybe we have the, you might say the framework to say something about that, you know, maybe we don't use words like freedom, maybe we use words like uh, um, better understanding or a little more ease and relaxation or we're just going to cultivate mindfulness together and that that will help um, my life be more skillful or something but in some way we have a shared intention right there we're on the eightfold path sama sankapa the you know right intention and the intention is towards this direction in some sense at least of the loving kindness and compassion. And perhaps if we really hold that seed of relinquishment, of understanding cessation, that's right there. Maybe it's clearly named, maybe it's not. But when we come together, that relational power is there. And immediately when we sit together, we have this experience we talked about of the sati beginning to grow because of the mutual reminding. And perhaps the investigation grows and so on. But right out of that, we're offered a contemplation. And now let's say we're going to talk about um, hunger, tanha, you know, the thirst of the self to be seen, or the thirst for pleasure and the fear of pain, this kind of thing. Well, now some of that, uh, you know, shared intention that we have some of the strength of the mindfulness that we have, and maybe we don't have much concentration yet, no problem, you know, there's plenty of time. And that is now in service of, hmm, I think I will investigate this tanha, this hunger, where is it? What is it? How do I experience that? How, how is that happening right now in this pause with you? And what are you telling me that I can learn of the inner world of your ta experience of tanha, of hunger? and cessation of hunger or increase of hunger. So already we've got the three elements and because the wisdom element is pointing the mind and sharpening it, maybe the energy comes up, oh wow, this feels important, this Tanha thing, you know? And what you're telling me and I'm receiving in the pause, in listen deeply, of the nature of Tanha is growing in my heart, not only a sense of compassion for you, but a sense of our shared human experience. It's not personal. It's not being named as, you've got hunger, pal. It's just a dynamic of being human, of being sentient, of having the body-mind structured like this, and so on. And as that relational quality ripens, it provides the basis, perhaps, for a further calming of the, the very hunger and thirst and fear and vigilance and protection and separation that, you know, characterize so much of our ways of being with other people. So the organism as a whole becomes more available to experience based on the power of the relational. Now this then sets the you know, conditions for 
the development of the tranquility, the concentration that comes out of that, the equanimity, which then helps this body-mind see more clearly into the nature of experience, into tanha or into, you know, um, perhaps the, the power of relinquishment, of letting go, and what that dynamic, what the nature of grasping is that comes out of tanha, and how it feels to soften and relax. So the wisdom aspect is growing, and then, you know, so you see, you see this quality of moving around among these three bases that is, uh, directly experienceable. It's not, you know, it's not some sort of, um, uh, I, I have tried not to make this stuff up. All I'm doing is projecting on onto what I'm observing, this schema or this framework of these three bases and checking it out. And what I'm seeing seems to fit, seems to be, have some value. So the fertile soil of the relational and the meditative has the seed of Dhamma planted in it that then grows its roots throughout the body mind. And well taught and well received, these roots, these tendrils of this living tree of Dhamma are actually proven effective. You know, they will. They will break up this soil, they will enrich this soil, they will hold the water, and they will provide the, the fruits. So, uh, at that intersection, perhaps some, we have something quite interesting, quite useful. Uh, so, from that standpoint, we can ask what is and what is not inside dialogue. So, frankly, it gets a little bit easier here. I don't want to get too glib about it. But if you don't have the meditative qualities of the mind, you're not going to have insight dialogue. You could have a nice discussion. You have relationship and you have dhamma. You could have a really good discussion of dhamma. But without the meditative element, you're not going to penetrate. You're just not. The mind is too noisy by habit. Uh, if you have, let's say, the wisdom piece and the meditative piece, like a traditional practice, you can have something really powerful, but without the relational aspect that provides that amplification, that acceleration of qualities, that investigation, all the things we've been talking about, um, you don't have insight dialogue. You can have the meditative qualities in relationship. And so you and I could sit down just like be mindful together. Like, okay, I'm really mindful now. Where do we go? I don't know. You know, so there's like, where's the, where's the rails, the guidance of wisdom? You'll have maybe some great experiences like, wow, just being seen feels so good. Of course it does. Of course it does. We all, we all thirst for that. And that's fine. But it's not inside dialogue. You might experience uh, even some kind of bliss in these kinds of staring, gazing practices. Great. Go for it. You know, you might really have something that you need right there. But will it be liberative? Might contribute in some ways, but it's not inside dialogue. It might be a preparatory practice, or it might be offered in a retreat as a um, let's do this so that we can refine just this part of it, no problem. But on the whole, insight dialogue involves all three of these uh, bases. So that's all well and good. Um, but let me ask you uh, <laughs> a little bit of preaching to the choir here, but why does it matter? Why, why bother? Life is complicated. A lot of things we could do. There's always the internet. <sighs> I 
what we're talking about in this synergy at this intersection of the three bases. Uh, I thought at the beginning when I was developing the practice, oh, this is crazy. This is, this is a hot fire. And it was uh, with a lot of caution that I went forward, frankly, because I had seen how uh, uh, fragile almost the mind is when meditative qualities get strong, you know, get very touchy because just one little thing and the whole organism is so undefended and so sensitive. Well, you add relationship, well, that's just insane. So it's a fire, you know, it's a hot, it's a, it's a powerful thing we're talking about here. But I'd like to point you towards, you know, your own, and I can speak about my own, entanglement. It's powerful too, you know? That tangled ball of yarn of the self and, and, and my story and my history. What, what penetrates? What enables clear seeing in, in, in what is potentially such a cloud? So just from the standpoint of the, 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 the process, you might say, towards liberation, just that. It's really a, can be a, a, a useful thing. But what about if we then say, wait a minute, I don't live in isolation. Within my family, there's relationships and some of them are difficult. Or we go even wider and we say, when I look at this culture around me and I see structural injustice, I see racial uh, profiling both within my own heart and all around me. I see uh, you know, sexual and economic injustices all around me. Well, these are made up of the aggregate, uh, you might say, tacit agreement of human beings with minds and hearts that are functioning exactly like mine. I am a participant in the systems of power and injustice. So not only from the standpoint of beginning at home where the work needs to be done, but in, from the standpoint of beginning to understand and function effectively within the, uh, let's call it the social change network. What we've already done with Inside Dialogue that is to me so beautiful is we've already bridged the meditative qualities and speaking and listening, being in relationship. And so there can be this uh, doorway, should we have the uh, strength of commitment, the courage to take that doorway, because it's not easy, right? It still is gonna be an alteration of our behaviors for sure. High level of commitment required, but it's a doorway. And it's a doorway to addressing what's not easy, whether it's some little conflict with someone I work with or within my family or the massive uh, uh, dysfunctions within a very greedy and blind culture. We've already begun to bridge the wisdom into function, into action. We've already begun to bridge the meditative qualities into the function of relationship. It's not a small thing. And uh, so, you know, I offer, I offer that as a uh, kind of a sense of possibility, a, a sense of opportunity. And, you know, we can look even in a much simpler way at the cultivation through our practice of the ungripping of the heart and the development of generosity, the development of meditative qualities that otherwise might not have been accessible to us. But with this practice, for some people I know, I get a number of people, this is a primary practice for them because silent traditional meditation they find difficulty settling the heart, settling the mind enough, and in the relational, 
it settles and it opens an, a doorway to the traditional practice too. Likewise, the development of metta, of compassion. It happens naturally in this practice and it's actively cultivated. It's embedded within the guidelines and uh, any given teacher may or may not name it. But when you pause and relax and that relaxing is named as allow and receive and we see that that receiving, that non-aversion, adosa, is this wholesome root that is metta, that is loving kindness, non-hatred, adosa, yielding to this kindness and care. It's happening in your practice. And likewise, this sitting in front of another and the natural, absolutely like water flowing down this downhill through a forest, you know, it's not gonna flow uphill. And the compassion is gonna flow in and between and among practitioners if you're actually practicing, you know, if your practice is balanced and, and uh, diligent. Uh, the conditions are just there. You know? Whether you try to make it or not, the conditions are there. The metta, the, the karuna, the compassion will arise. So, it may be pointing to something within the community of practice that's, I think, interesting and bears further investigation and certainly further development in my own thinking and maybe in yours, is what does this schema of these three bases have to contribute to teaching insight dialogue, to sharing it with others? It's a great way to assess, how's my teaching going? Is it balanced? How's this retreat going? Or how's this course that I'm offering going? Are the meditative qualities being well cultivated or not? Have a look, parse it out. Don't just, you know, it gives you a way of looking at something that's otherwise maybe, you know, glommed together. How is the development of the Dhamma? How clear am I offering and staying with these wisdom teachings? How are the relational qualities? How, how am I in relationship with the practitioners? And how are they with each other? What am I seeing in the hall or in, you know, just an evening offering? And so it's, it's very useful for uh, a teacher in terms of assessing how that's going, but also it's useful for um, assessing teachers, right? How is this person's relational capacity? they're good with Dhamma, but their relatedness is like a little weak. Or you might say, wow, they're so loving and warm, but like the Dhamma is a little bit thin at the edges there, you know? Like, let's develop that. Let's train that. Let's, let's, let's um, support that quality to excellence, to excellence in all three of these areas. Uh, so you could also take this framework as a way of saying, Okay, so if this, is, if this schema does have some value, if it's, if it's explanatory or it provides some guidance, maybe it's a way of looking at everything we're doing, like whether within meta programs or anywhere else, in terms of how we structure our programs, trainings, what have you. Um, and some people might even say, how's my life, you know? How's the relatedness in my life? How's the Dhamma in my life? How are the meditative qualities growing or not in my life? So we're talking about a, a whole picture of this liberative path, right? And uh, it's not always easy. If this is a, if, if this uh, three basis um, way of understanding things can shed some light, that's really great, really helpful. But even when it's not easy, like when you find, oh, I, you look at, the, you know, how you're relating with others and there's, you know, uh, closure or narcissism, self-cherishing and so on then 
with patience, with compassion, you see, ah, I can practice. I can reflect. I can enter into this investigation with others and see what I cannot see alone. It's a, you know, quite a beautiful uh, opportunity. And, um, you know, the direction is the same, the taste of salt, good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end. It's all in the direction of unbinding. So thank you very much. And uh, may all beings, without exception, benefit from our time together, our work together, from your individual practice and your relational practice. May all beings benefit. And uh, may the intentions that we share that are wholesome be uh, received and let in and may they grow towards goodness. So thanks a lot. May all beings be free. Bye-bye.